Hey, everybody. It's good to see you all here again. Um, let's see, I am going to um, turn off uh, the waiting room. And so people can directly join us when they wish to. So um, welcome, folks. Um, this is our educators forum, uh, where we share thoughts and ideas about um, different aspects of using Nature Journal in uh, classroom education or homeschooling um, or informal education settings. And it's an open discussion um, between all of us, the participants. Um, and I want to encourage folks to, um, to please freely share your thoughts and ideas. Um, our only requirements are that we kind of maintain uh, uh, respect for everybody in the group. Uh, we just, uh, we, one of the um, really, uh, wonderful parts of the next generation science standards is that they they get they're, they're that's built into it that we're sort of training students to uh, engage in discourse. So how do we discuss things in a way to explore ideas, um, to test our opinions and thoughts about it, um, and do that in a way that is um doesn't shut anybody down is respectful to all the other folks in the group um, they call it making uh, arguments from evidence so we're training kids how to make arguments from evidence um, and how to do that in a way that we actually are communicating with each other um, and we want to do the the same thing here um so uh just as we are uh, discussing things, we always want want to bear in mind what are the um, what are, are are ways to fully engage in the conversation, be able to share your ideas, and um, make this a kind of welcoming platform for everybody else who's here. So, um, <clears throat> let's see. The last time we met, um, um, I kind of went on a a a, a uh, sort of a bit of a diatribe. Um, I got started on kind of looking at um, uh, this the structure of questions and and inference and uh, really did a deep dive in that. But there wasn't really time for any discussion um, uh, about that. And I was wondering, just sort of in the the area of of asking questions and how do we go about answering questions. Um, if anybody had thoughts or ideas um, to, to share, um, either experiences that you've had doing investigations with, with students, things that you have found to, to be um, either a really positive experience or um, challenges that you've had um, with getting kids to do investigations and inquiry. Um, I think would be a, um, a a very interesting subject for us to unpack. Uh, so maybe to get us started, um, what I am um, so uh, uh, Avea, have you used the um, the breakout rooms function before on Zoom? Are you familiar with how that works? Um, would it be all right it, with you if I um, if I made you a co-host, mm -hmm. and then we um, broke out into um, some some small groups, um, just sort of with the uh, and in those small groups, sort of gave everybody a chance to um, to discuss um, an idea. Then we'll all kind of come back. Right. So, um, Avea, I'm making you a co-host. You're now a co-host. Check you out. Um, 
And so, so here's uh, what we're going to do. Um, uh, this is uh, something which we call think, pair, share. And um, where uh, if we are, if you just ask a group of, of students of any age a question, um, the kids who are like really good at, at kind of thinking on their, their, their feet and are also kind of accustomed to saying the first thing that comes out to the top of their head um, will always pop their hands up. And uh, so we often um, hear from those kids. But uh, if you ask a question and then you give students a chance to kind of think about it for a little bit and then, and then to actually talk it back and forth with uh, a, one or a couple of other people a little bit, we find that in that process, you're able to kind of hatch ideas. You are able to um, then get, um, when you're discussing them, those ideas with somebody, very often we have chances to, to change our mind, to refine our questions and our, 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 our thoughts and ideas. I know for me, many times when I start to sort of say something partway through the explanation, I realize like, oh, actually, <laughs> that was a bad idea. Um, but it's actually in the discourse that that happens. And then when we come back and you can hear everybody's ideas, there's often a, a much higher level of kind of student involvement um, and participation. So we as educators, we're going to actually just model that right here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask everybody just to grab a pencil and a piece of paper and to write down on the piece of paper, um, you know, how um, the, 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 the general kind of, uh, kind of guiding question is here is um, how, um, how uh, sort of what, what is your experience with kind of uh, kids doing their own investigations to, to, to problem solve about a question that they have. Um, and if you haven't done that with real kids where you um, have them doing investigations of something to try to figure something out, um, then just sort of riff on what your kind of ideas and thoughts might be about that. Um, but the, the, the general thought here is um, uh, in, in, uh, sort of student investigations to solve problems. What, what works, what doesn't work. And so let's just take a moment right now. And I'm going to ask everybody just for one minute to just do, uh, just to, you know, write down a couple of bullet points or ideas um, about that topic. And um, then we're going to drop over into some breakout rooms. And you'll have a chance to bat some of those ideas around. So again, the question or kind of guiding thought here is um, student um, investigations to solve problems, what works and what doesn't. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, create uh, breakout rooms. Uh, each room will have two or three people in it. And what I would like you to do um, in that is just, um, and we'll, what we'll do is we'll have, we'll have uh, a, a couple of minutes in there. Um, um, maybe uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go for, actually, let's go for five, five minutes to, to discuss um, you know, what, what kind of came up for you, um, what came up for your other partners in the room, again, where the general topic is with student, um, student directed investigations, what works, what doesn't work. Um, and then we will um, have a chance to sort of share some of those ideas around. And your goal here is as you hear ideas from other people um, to, that you really like, to kind of star those and incorporate them into your kind of idea matrix of kind of what you're kind of emer what's emerging for you as sort of best practices with this. If your thought on your idea 
is changed during that discussion, then modify what you're thinking. The idea is here, can you through the discussion um, come uh, sort of change your mind or refine an idea? So the idea is you come out of the discussion with the other people in your group. Um, you come out of that discussion, not the same way that you went in, right? So either modifying your ideas or taking somebody else's idea and incorporating that into what, to what you're doing. That's, that's, our, that's our goal for this little session. Hey everybody. Welcome back. So um, now what I'd love to do is just to, to hear from, um, from some folks about in the discussion that you just had, uh, what are some ideas that are kind of the most interesting for you about that right now? Um, what when I ask sort of, when you think about student investigation and what works, what doesn't work, uh, what kind of came to, uh, what for, for you in this is, is the most um, interesting and exciting of the uh, ideas that are kind of buzzing around in your head. And I think that people can unmute themselves and you can share those as, as you feel comfortable. <laughs> Well, I'll start. Um, and I have my video on and I don't have to leave at 1240 today. Okay. <laughs> because it's finals week and it's kind of nice to have some other time. Um, I think what I found going into the breakout room personally, and this is me personally, was that um, to really open up a lot about things is that it I found it the most interesting to maybe investigate the people that were in my room immediately rather than the details of yeah. the specific question. Um, and I think that's about building trust, which as a public education teacher, yeah. I think one of the things that people have been forgetting, and this is my opinion, is that not meeting in person, you don't feel that um, human energy, and it might take longer to get a trust with or get to know people. So, um, you know, to open up, you know, in a classroom. And then somebody was saying in the classroom, which this goes along with that, is one of the, our breakout, um, Aisha, uh, wherever. And she, she was mentioning that, of course, kids will pod with their friends and if their friends are interested <laughs> then they get interested and we're no different yep you're right <laughs> it's so true i'm gonna i was there with marcy i'm just gonna jump in hi jack and um I, I joined this because I'm trying to do more nature journaling myself and with my students and, you know, taking Jack's classes in the past and school is closed today. So I was like, I can come because there is no lunch break. There's no such thing as a lunch break. And <laughs> we're back in person. There, there was even less of a lunch break during remote learning. But I'm just to actually talk, just suddenly be in a group with like educators <laughs> who are probably interested in nature. I just feel like jumping up and down with joy. And I was like, there, and there's somebody from Point Blue here. I love Point Blue and oh my God. And it's not 500 people, it's a small group. And you know, <laughs> uh, but I did refine my idea. I did what Jack said to do. I, I was like, oh, I must be one of those types of people, right? Cause Marcia was like, let's connect. And I'm like, well, the question was, <laughs> um, but I did refine my idea, which I'm actually have sh decided that's a good thing to share with my students. Like, did they refine their idea? And it was my term was social dynamics is what I will take back mm -hmm. with me. It depends on my students, social dynamics, whether they will investigate something they themselves were curious about, or if they'll just go do something else completely. When the dynamics click, they investigate. If they don't, nobody 
wants to investigate because the uncool kid brought mm -hmm. up the question. And that, and and then as an educator, I'd suddenly there, I really feel like I have no control anymore. It, it was all about the social dynamics and I can force something the next time I see them, I only see them once a week, but the magic of the investigation was only if the dynamics went well, and I'll stop at that. Um, uh, just off of that, I, I, mean, I went to graduate school at Bank Street College of Education and Parsons School of Design. And one of the books that I remember the title of <laughs> was called Managing Chaos. And it was probably the best book <laughs> about teaching and I, I'll probably think of a name of a, one of the other books, but I've always remembered that because there's theory and practice, but this book was Managing Chaos. I don't know the author um, and it's been a while. So if it's in print or not. <laughs> but, but, but that's a recommended read for us? Well, it's been a while. So um, I do remember the title. Okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Excellent. So this is this is interesting. Yeah, yeah thinking about, um, you know, we've we've got, you know, the what are, what are some of the the aspects of the social dynamics between students that um, make things either click or can derail you. That's that's. I think it's that's, safety. I think it's like safety like psychological safety, like, you know, you were talking about the uncool kids. Well, what, what defines cool? You know, cool is kind of like liking what you like and liking it with gusto and being okay to like share that and not be made fun of and having like a psychologically safe place to do that. Yeah, and I see our school struggling with that. Like, the, it's the kids who have decided somebody's uncool and somebody else is alpha. And I'm just kind of watching what's going and simply just making deductions of like what's happening. Yeah, I think you know, a lot of it is trying to be an anthropologist. I think a lot of it can be fear as well, right? So maybe, you know, we're talking about those social dynamics. Um, you know, if somebody's thinking that it's uncool, you know, maybe the question is why are they thinking it's uncool? Are they thinking it's uncool because they're scared to draw? They're scared to write a sentence because they know that they're struggling in those areas, right? So sometimes it's, you know, it can be attitude and sometimes that uncoolness or whatever is like, well, if I just tell everybody it's uncool, they'll maybe follow me and then I can still keep secret that, you know, I, I, I'm not feeling confident in my spelling or I'm not feeling confident in my writing abilities to be able to do this. And I don't want anybody to know that. So I'm going to just make it uncool and people are going to follow me so that I can keep my secret hidden. Uh, and really my secret is my own fear that I'm not good enough to be doing this. Right. So I think that would come with, you know, um, the educators being able to know their students and, and hopefully being able to, to present it in a way that, that is hopefully creating those safe spaces that, that we're talking about as well. Right. So it could be something to think about. So in our group, um, it was Sharon who brought up a really interesting point about um, the, the quieter people might be comfortable on Zoom and they are maybe entering things in the chat but not wanting to speak on screen or you know, be highlighted. And when we can return to classrooms and live settings, maybe it would be helpful to have a way to have people contribute through a chat like thing, like write on a sticky note and put it up on a board or just have a whiteboard going so that as thoughts occur to people, they can add those without being spotlighted. And I also saw that in Brian Hickenbotham's group um, on Saturday, he asked what brought people to nature journaling and it got very emotional. And one person was talking about how through these virtual sessions, they've overcome um, pretty deep-seated social anxiety. And it was really touching and also kind of made you think, wow, some people are really suffering from, you know, maybe they have great ideas and 
a lot going on, but they're scared to share it. So I think that's an important aspect of, of what's going on here. Yeah, that is, you know, the, one of the things, oh, one sorry. of the things that I brought up was uh, motivation, understanding uh, what it motivates the student. And sometimes that's just to understand exactly what the, um, the teacher wants, or it could be um, grades or, you know, something like that. But um, I was in a class and um, the teacher had asked us uh, just simply, you know, gave us a rock and said, you know, explain it any way you want to on a piece of paper. So that if you, you know, he didn't explain why he just gave us a rock and said, you know, write down everything you can think of on ways to you know, express this rock on paper. And we didn't understand, you know, where he was going with this, why he was asking us to do it or anything like that. And um, then he had us put all of our rocks into a pile and we had to uh, figure out whose rock was who um, by the descriptions that they gave. And then once we started hearing the other people in the group explain, you know, how they thought about a rock, it opened up more thoughts um, and it got us uh, thinking more and other ways to like think outside the box. And because uh, we weren't, we were all at first, you know, it's hard, it's, you know, it's dark, you know, or whatever. But then later on, he was giving us, you know, different ways of thinking about it, like how long is it compared to a dollar, or, you know, uh, using, you know, different tools that were at our, at our, you know, that we had that we didn't even know we had, and we didn't even think about until we started working together as a group. And if he would have maybe, you know, given us a, like our motivation or why we were doing this at the beginning, he may have gotten more uh, creative thoughts during that process. So sometimes maybe just understanding the teacher's motivation might help. So under, understanding the teacher's motivation and kind of an interesting thing that you're saying there's uh, also tying into that is that understanding what, also thinking about kind of what is going to really motivate those different students in the group. Where if we're talking about all these people with these, um, with, sort of, with these sort of hierarchies and different social dynamics, people may be, um, what, what is going to mot motivate one student will be different than another. Um, and so kind of having some finger on that pulse would also be really helpful. Knowing their why, why they're there, why they're doing what they're doing, you know, what, what they expect as an outcome themselves maybe not necessarily your outcome, but theirs. I've never heard that expressed that way. You said knowing their why. That is, that's a, 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 an, an interesting way to, um, to, to, to think about that. Could you un unpack sort of the idea of knowing their why just a little bit more for me? I really like that. Well, sometimes um, if you want to achieve a goal, you have to know why you want to achieve that goal. And so therefore, you, um, if you have a real re strong reason why, it'll motivate you to obtain that goal. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, I'd like to jump in on that, Liz. Thank you for getting me, giving me that phrase too. I've been experimenting a lot with that this last year, like the metacognition piece. And I started actually with my third graders, I started with my fifth graders and then moved back to fourth and third grade and just hey, this is one of the kinds of skills we're working on and you all are learning. And um, this is what we're gonna be doing for the next hour to get you to this place or help you start getting to this place. And I see when I start talking like that, the attention change and they look at me because I'm suddenly being real to them and they feel it. They just feel something shift. It's been a fascinating, experimentation as an educator, really, you know, after 20 years, I'm trying it like for the first time this last year or so. That's something that I've experienced with um, certain students as well is um, how are they gonna use that in their normal lives, whatever they're learning? Um, because 
when you use it, you remember it. But if you're just learning something that seems to be over your head, then you don't necessarily, you think, why am I even learning this? But then if you're, so, it's something that you regularly see or do or use, then then that will stick with them and they'll be a lot more motivated to try things out um, and to learn those things, or if it's interesting to them. Yeah. Right. Um, I had an interesting thing happen uh, with a parent actually um, this week um, that was asking the question of why her child was doing this. And so I was doing a nature journaling session virtually with, um, I would look after some behavioral kid classes. So I go in and do outdoor ed with them uh, normally when we're in school, um, but some of the kids are online. And so I've known some of these kids for three years and they're all, um, for the most part, uh, this group of students was all working well below their grade level. Um, and so they were needing their parents' assistance. Um, you know, some of the expectation is, did they turn on the computer for the day and did they sit in their chair? Um, that's sort of where we're at. They have ADHD and ODD and there's trauma and there's a whole bunch of different things. Um, and so I'm, I'm working along with this student who I know is low um, in, in writing and um, things like that. And um, he has an apple in front of him and he's doing his I notice, I wonder, and he's getting a little frustrated. I and mean, we're just wa you know walking him through it, like do the best you can. You don't have to write perfect sentences, like just use one word, um, you know, answer sounded out the best you can. Like we're not worried about spelling, things like that. And then mom came over and she was like, I don't understand why we're doing this what's the point? And I was like, that's a really great question. And so then I explained to her the whole thing about why we were doing it and how it could be integrated cross-curricular, um, you know, and that we were working actually by doing this was working on his uh, writing as well as his numbers and being able to go through all these different processes in one spot. And it took me probably like 10, 15 minutes. And then she went, oh, okay that makes sense and then she was willing to continue on and sort of help him but I thought oh this is the first time I've run across this so again mm -hmm. knowing your why I had to give a knowing your why to a mom uh, mm -hmm. who's at home who has you know several other kids in the in the back that are doing school as well and and she um, has a, a, a young son who is dealing with his own sort of issues. So I thought that was interesting. So um, uh, yeah, the knowing your why with Liz, that really was like, oh, I had that experience this week. So I just wanted to share that. Could be even with a parent. <laughs> oh, that's a really, that's a really cool thought. The, um, and, and when we are, I, I know that I, have done things with 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 groups of students with classes and i looking back on it i am i'm not uh convinced in that i like i i don't think i may have had had a real justifiable why between you know sometimes like why am i doing this like because because it's in the curriculum it because it's something i'm supposed to be doing right now and <laughs> but but i'm not legitimately behind that why right and mm -hmm. ooh, ow ow that's that's rough to be in in that 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 situation and just to to tie it back who was it at the start who kind of led us off with the idea of trust right and yeah oh so yeah um so 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 marcia was was talking about kind of the importance of of trust and um and I want to take that idea and connect it in with this why. Um, once we've established a lot of rapport, um, they may have sort of confidence that, you know, like, right, you're, you're on task with kind of the, the things that you uh, ask us to do are going to be worth my time, right? There's a real, there's, there's a legitimate reason to be doing this. Um, at the start, we have to develop that, 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 that trust. One way we can develop that trust is then by um, by making sure that we are in sync with our why, that the yeah. why that I'm asking you to do is really worthwhile. And then I want to present that to you. Like here's here's this is, you know, here's here's why we're doing this. Here's here's my why. And this is why I think it is really worth your while. And um, 
and so then and then we're going to 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 go into this and and i need you to so just this is this is where i'm going with this and let's let's try this trust it let's ex just sort of you know give this a shot and then let's kind of regroup at the end and sort of see if i came through on sort of on 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 getting what i wanted to you um i'm wondering if that that this idea of sharing your why uh, first being being square with your why and then sharing your why is is sort of part of developing trust and rapport with our yeah. our, our, our students in, in, in community um definitely <laughs> john uh, you came to my school eight years ago maybe 10 years ago and presented in the big auditorium and then you came over to our art classrooms and you presented something to them and you drew in your sketchbooks. But before you did that, you had established your why with the film, with sharing your uh, nature books, you know, your guides. And so the kids normally who were quite unruly and I think we threw two classrooms together, which you may not have known, and they were standing on desks, leaning over each other, trying to watch you draw. And you didn't have overheads back then. You were just painting and drawing in your lap. And they were all quiet and watching. I was amazed. And it was your authenticity. And I think that's it. I'll write that word down. Yeah. I think it was they, they uh, saw how important that was to you in a way that they had not paid a lot of attention to us, you know, in a normal classroom. Yeah, I, I, I've, I have found that it's a really powerful hook to you, you walk in with your box of journals and yes. then I, just, I pass those journals out on the table to all the kids and just say, please uh, right. these pages carefully because these are my original documents. There are no copies of these. And this is, these are my, my my original field notes and uh this is what i want to be um sharing with you guys today yeah. um and then they kind of they start digging into those and they kind of go like oh this is interesting there's something there's something yeah. there's, there's a legit hook there like oh you're going to be showing me how to do this how to connect with this and you've done it you know right. you have done it. and you published you know you shared i think you gave us a box of reference books and not only gave it to the class but passed them out and showed them how to use them in a very uh, engaging way and I think you know that that also uh, probably started a few kids you know it wasn't a class on nature journaling but it certainly did help yeah, yeah. I think in general if you're an educator in any type and if you're excited and you show passion for what's happening, um, you tend to be able to get everybody else, like for the most part on board, right? Um, I always let the kids know, like when I'm doing nature journal, I'm, I always have my own journal and I'm like, here it is, you know? And then near the end, I say, you know, I'd like to share with you one of my journal entries and say, this is how I organized it. This is some of the questions I had, you know? And I kind of do that. And then um, last week, it was really funny that it's fun spiraled into like, how long have you been doing it for? What's yeah. your favorite entry? Where do you want to go in the world to be able to, what do you want to journal? What's on your list? And I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know the answers to these questions, but it made me even, it made me even more excited to be like, that's a great question. And I don't know, but this is where I could go. This would be really neat, you know? And so they got excited just by seeing that I am not just, you know, teaching it or you know running a session that that i'm taking you know i'm doing it as well and this is something i'm doing with my family and, and i'm doing it on my personal time and then i can share that as well which was really exciting and then i said to them like now you get to share with somebody in your class what it is that you've been doing and things like that so i think coming with and it's hard right like i get it and we're in a pandemic and some days just suck and so you don't you don't always just want to be super excited but you know, sometimes we, we have to uh, turn it on. I'm, 
kind of a, a funny thing. Um, I used to be a canoe trip guide like years ago before I got into the education part of it. And if something was kind of going wrong, I would always say you got to get into guide mode, right? And so it's like your brain went from being like, woo, I'm the guide to like focus, right? And so now it's the same thing. Like you might be feeling kind of crappy, but it's like you got to get into teacher mode and be excited for those kids who have showed up into class that day kind of thing, you know? And sometimes we just have to turn off our own stuff and, and make it about the kids and the people that are in front of us and and being able to give them the best possible experience um because we want them that's that's the whole reason we got into it right so i think being excited in general and and in, you know having a lot of passion i think can bring a lot of a lot of that along and it will naturally kind of happen not always but sometimes yeah it w when somebody else is really excited and connecting with something um i um I know for me, it really pulls me in. Somebody, when I was starting college, um, somebody gave me the advice um, that was by the end of the semester, see if you can really deeply understand and feel why this person who is teaching the class has devoted their life to this subject and this area. And see if you can um, bite off a piece of that pie. Um, and to, to legitimately get into like, why have you spent your life doing a deep dive in statistics, right? What is the beauty there? What is the excitement about that? And, and really sort of show me the relevance. And there are teachers who are teaching it and they're not excited about it. They are totally disconnected from that subject. And you can't do it in that, in that context because they really don't care. Um, and and then there's also the situation of when I know that the, 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 the sort of the natural excitement, people are like, like it does kind of get people to lean in. And I know that there are times that I have used that as a, as a hook, as a tool in kind of a, I, I fake it, where I'm pretending that I'm really excited about this. And I've been doing something, this is confession, where I'm not excited about it. And like, and I'm pretending. Um, and I think that those sorts of experiences, that initial kind of excitement can kind of pull people in. And then people are there, they, you got them there with your excitement and then there's no, there's no meat, there's no there there, there's no place to actually land and connect with why you really care so much about this. And I think that that, that breaks that trust that, that Marshall was talking about that breaks that authenticity. Um, I, when I used, I used to do uh, residential outdoor education and I found that for me, the best sort of student investigations would be when we would kind of find a mystery out there in nature and I legitimately didn't know what was going on with it. And we started kind of looking for clues and trying to figure this out and then assembling the skeleton. And then we discovered like, yeah, I really think this is a mountain lion kill. This is crazy. I think, yeah, this is a legit, this is a mountain lion kill, right? Um, there was another instructor um, who had been teaching for a long time and he always did the same soil study in the same place, in the same way every week and he was it was it was kind of easy for him to kind of drop into his banter and his routine but the kids really weren't into it and i think that a big part of the reason that was that, that that he wasn't so i think maybe one thing we sort of started off talking about these sort of student investigations maybe one element of that is where you are legit with the mystery um, one of the things that drives me up a tree is when naturalists are playing kind of like, guess what's in my head, right? Like you can tell that they know what they're doing and they're like, and they're, I'm up there, like I'm being all like Socratic, Socratic method person. And so like, you know, and asking you some questions about things. Um, and then you're going to come to your own conclusion. But I know that I know the answer and you know that I know the answer and I'm kind of letting you kind of get there on your own. Um, and yeah, that's probably better than me just telling you, but it's totally different than 
I don't know, you don't know, you know, I don't know, and I know you don't know. We both don't know together. And this is, and let's kind of dig in here. And that's, that's, that's an authentic, an authentic mystery. Um, and that's what gets me excited. And then um, I find that the, if then students also kind of pick up on that. And we're like, we're in this real big mystery. Like, oh man, like what is up with these track patterns, trees, poo, piles, what is, and um, so that's, that's that thought. I was just now thinking about that, sort of the relationship between the excitement, the authenticity, the student connection, because I know that like I can, that for, for me, the danger of kind of like going into teacher mode is that sometimes I'm doing that and where I can't really square with the, but this goes back to the why, that if I'm not down with the why fully, fully embracing that why, I think that's it, then, um, then that connection of authenticity um, isn't there. Yeah, I just want to clarify the teacher mode. I think because I only teach the things that I'm into. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think for me, if I'm, if I'm maybe just having a, a bad day, like I'm tired or I'm cranky or maybe I'm not feeling as well. I think that's, that's sort of what I meant by getting into teacher mode, because I know when I get outside, I am teaching what I love. So yeah. I, I will forget about my own, like, I'm not, I have a stuffy nose or whatever, like forget all of that because this is my teacher mode is that I'm going to, I'm going to be excited because I am generally excited about what it is I teach. But I think yeah. that's, that's probably more of what I meant is that because I teach, the, I only teach what I like. Right. So, I mean, that's the, the, the nice thing about being in outdoor education is that it's very specific. I'm not teaching statistics. Right. So I don't have to worry about that. So I, I think that I just wanted to clarify it because I agree with you. If there's no authenticity to it, then it, it really is. It doesn't matter. Right. It's still going to be the same thing is you not being excited about it if there's no meat to back it up with my whole thing was like if you're having a bad day yeah, yeah. get on board with what you're teaching um that kind of thing but yeah you you can't you can't fake it till you make it in these situations it's not going to work and i also think that um the, the why changes over time and that you always have to go back and reevaluate your why um so if you get stuck and you realize you're stuck go back and ask yourself again, why? And then sometimes you don't just ask yourself once why you have to, if you get your why keep digging until you get down to the real why. Sometimes I wonder. Saying, I think Jack that, or John, that you like to uh, uh, learn basically. I mean, learning something new is what is your why is your excitement. And that's what, you know, it comes across to all of us, because I think every time you go out, you have a new experience. You always have some kind of new experience that happens. And I think that's what motivates you. And I think that might be your why also. Yeah, I think you're, you're, you're absolutely right. That, 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 that kind of, that, that kind of continuing learning, um, that, that's a huge motivation for me. And it, that's my happy place. Um, by the way, Billy Joe, I, 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 I didn't uh, interpret what you're saying as you putting on a pretend happy, um, but I was just trying to riff off of that and kind of out myself where I know that there are times that I have actually pretended to be excited about something in a classroom situation. And um, it's what's interesting about that is the experience of doing that is in addition to being not the same connection with the kids, it's also exhausting as, as, as an educator. I, I, fin I, I finished that day and I'm just like, and, and there's, there's nothing left in my tank. Um, but when you're out there with where you can connect, like you're saying, Billy Joe, with something that you are authentically in love with and then let your heart come out to play with that, that's, it's weird on those days where you may not have started feeling energized. You come back from that day in the field with those students and you're just like, ah, that was great. 
um, this, it's funny, there's a, we run a sugar bush um, uh, every year. So we make maple syrup um, and it's, uh, I don't get to be as creative in what we're teaching. It's uh, stations are set up and the kids kind of travel between the stations. And it's exactly that where like, I try to be excited, but like, I'm over it, right? Like, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to talk about how maple syrup is sort of made again to the same speech to a different group. And yes, I will agree. Those are the days that even no matter how much happy you kind of put on it, I'm just like, they're not as fun as the days where I get to take a, a kids off trail um, and sort of experience, you know, what is happening kind of in front of us and, and be really, you know, authentically excited. So those programs are always really tough for me to be really stagnant and, there's not a lot of room for that creativity. So yeah, you're right. I'm always more tired on those days for sure. Yeah, and um, and just sort of, uh, and, and then Ar Arpan was uh, asking a, an interesting question in the chat. Yeah, uh, he, he was asking about um, what what when you know the answer to something, then 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 what what do you do? How do you deal with that? Um, and that so for, for me, like I was saying, it's the most fun for me when I'm kind of in that place of not knowing. Um, a lot of um, so what I what I what might I tend to do, which kind of works to kind of re kind of energize me, is I'll kind of I can kind of get into the process of figuring things out and share some of that process with with the students. Um, but very often, what I find is rather than trying to pull out of the students what I already know and kind of get them to say photosynthesis, yes, that's correct, right? Um, if I share what I do know and use that to get me and the group closer to the brink of the edge of what we don't know, so um, then you can kind of jump, still kind of keep playing around in that pool of the mystery. So um, sometimes people will be like, let's say you're like, what kind of track is this? Um, you can sort of show people the, the, the clues and kind of walk them through that process, which I find interesting. You know, it's, it's you know, tracking is just, you know, inference laid bare where you're kind of removing possibilities. And that's, that's a cool process. Um, but what I like to do is when we're there looking at those tracks, there, there should be something that I don't know, I don't understand, and I don't get in what we're uh, um, observing. And for me to sort of find those things in those tracks that don't make sense to me or that I don't know, um, and kind of out myself with whatever that mystery is. And the more you practice asking questions, then the more you realize that like, there are these questions everywhere around you. And that rather than sort of staying safely in what you, you do know, like, like, okay, like, you know, I, um, so, you know, we could spend our whole time with me getting you to be able to say, oh, it's a coyote track. Yes, it's a coyote track. Or we can kind of more quickly kind of go through it, right? this is a coyote track, here's how we know, here's the tool that we look at to say, okay, this is a coyote track. And then we're using that bit of information to launch us into the more interesting question of what is going on here with these tracks patterns and what is the story here, right? Um, so very often I think you can get, um, you can find a more interesting question that gets you into even your personal unknown zone. Um, so I, 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 so that I, th I think just in response to Arpan's question about like, what do you do then? My, my approach is I, I, I like to try to, as fast as I can, run to the brink, the edge of my understanding, and then start leaning out as far as I can. And that's where kind of interesting things happen. So what you're saying is don't be afraid, afraid to be vulnerable. Don't be afraid to admit that you don't know something. Oh, and, 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 and not just that, just wear, wear that on your sleeve. Wear that on your sleeve. So the, uh, hold on a second, I, so I have, 
So when I'm doing a program with kids in the Sierra Nevada, um, they think I have the answers because I wrote this book, right? And they look at this like, okay, this is, this is the answer book of all the nature stuff. And what I like to, to sort of show is that, all right, no, that's a tool. And the amount which we understand is this minuscule superficial scraping on the top of the pile of all that could be explored and known. And I want to completely embrace um, how much I don't know and, 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 and play there. That's where things get cool. That actually is, so when I'm writing in my journals, when I'm doing stuff in, in my journals and I am um, asking questions and, and wondering about things. So part of that is, so part of that is um, when I'm putting in these big colorful question marks, um, this serves two purposes. One is it for me really extra emphasizes to me that this question out of the other, there's a bunch of other questions that don't have big question marks next to them, but this one got a really big question mark. And that's my way on a meta level of saying, ooh, really fun, big mystery, right? And, and also then I can hold this page up and my students see it. And the students see all those questions all over those pages. And then they're saying like, oh, you also don't know. Um, so I, I, I love to kind of wear on my sleeve the idea that for all that I've done studying nature and natural history, um, all that does is open up a new level of more, of, of richer, and more um, interesting questions. Um, you know, Jack, there was once, if I could, you, something you shared that has kept me going so often, and it was years ago, a Sierra natural history class I took with you, um, but you said you may know the name of that bird, but do you know that individual bird? And that got me away from naming so fast. I heard you. And I teach it, you know, I'm the naturalist at a school garden now. And oh my God, it's like group after group, day after day. There's not that many mysteries that I'm finding mystifying, but I can still go, okay, I don't actually know this particular group of aphids and they're certainly new to my students and how can I push myself to first find my reading glasses so I can see the damn <laughs> aphids <laughs> and then push myself to ask some questions instead of going yep aphids on kale yep been there seen that because otherwise I'm going to die as a teacher I'm not going to be able to keep going with my own self and it's really been you being like, do you know this individual bird yeah. that um, has helped me stay in that place? Yeah, that, that, yeah that, that actually has the same impact on me. Um, and that was uh, an idea that I took from naturalist Rich Stalka. Oh. Um, and um, Rich um, people would say, like, what's that? You know, uh, people would say, that's a robin. And then they'd be ready to go on to the next thing. And um, Rich would sort of help people sort of see that, yes, you've seen a robin before, but what about this robin on this day at this time, right? You know, it, and that really brings you into this moment on at a very different level. Um, and if I said, yeah, I know Homo sapiens, right? I know people. Yeah, no problem. Um, how, how do I know that? I, I can identify them even at a great distance. I can spot, yep, there's a human being, right? Do I understand human beings? 
Not in the slightest, right? There's so much more richness and nuance there. Um, and we, when we kind of look around, we kind of identify all the rest of the people around us as individuals. But then we look at, at, at American Robins and they're part of this thing we call American Robins. And, and what we do with it is we walk up and stop observing at the point where we've got it identified. And, and the name is, the name of the thing is just something that human beings completely made up. And the American Ornitholo Ornithological Union will get under the hood and change those names around every few years when somebody else needs a new PhD, right? And, um, and, and that's cool. We're learning more about speciation and those sorts of processes, but, but that's, not, that's not knowing the thing. That's not knowing the bird. And um, yeah, the more that you can be authentic with how much you don't know and don't understand. And, and also good strategy in that, you know, when you're there in the garden looking at the same situation, um, it really, really helps to be kind of to get you into that that the the the, the zone of, of of finding of finding the um, finding the novel in the familiar phenomena. You know, how can you find we we're 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 a species that really we we sit up and we pay attention when there's when there's a new stimulus in our environment. Um, so. That can be a new species, but can it be new, a new observation about a species that you've seen before or a new behavior about the species that you've seen before? And I think the best way to kind of find those things is just to be self-monitoring for the very subtle feeling of a micro surprise. The little thing that kind of not makes you go like, <gasps> right? But the thing that makes you kind of go, huh, right? The little, huh, right? <coughs> the, and what that is, is that little uh feeling is your physiological reaction to something in your observed environment that is different than your mental, mental model of how that thing should be. And when we get that, and there's that dissonance between reality and our mental model, we get that little uh, right? And very often what we do is we don't stop to be like, oh, I just got to uh. Right, and let's dig in there because there's something really to be learned here. But we just kind of, you know, shovel it over. So, constantly monitoring yourself for the little, the little micro surprises. I think is, that's a, a that's a powerful way of finding those moments. Um, I'd like to add something. Please, please. Uh, when we started, we were talking first about our students. And now we've kind of switched it around and we're talking about our why. And I'd like to go back to thinking about the students. And we started out by talking about getting to know and to build trust. So maybe if we find out at the beginning what their why is, that also helps. Yes. Uh, uh, unpack that for us a little bit more. There's, there, there, this, is, this is rich. Well, I was noticing that we were first talking about uh, Maslow and, you know, the social dynamics and the safety and the fear and the, the getting to know and to build trust. And I think one of the ways we can do all those things is by finding out their why, what's motivating them. Um, and then I think you bring all of those other things in together. I think by getting to know them, getting to know their why builds on that, the social dynamics, because other people will hear also what is motivating other people, why other people are there, you know, why we've all come together to do this and we'll be able to build maybe even on our own why. Mm -hmm. and, and when you say, and you know, when you're saying earlier about to know their why, that's not to make my why really well articulated to them, right? You're, you're saying fundamentally know their why. I think you could start by letting them know your why, because yeah. that'll help build trust too. Uh, and then they'll kind of know where we're going with this. But I think you also need to know their why and why they're there, why they're taking the time to spend that time with you and to, you know, 
give them what they need by knowing their why. And then I think that you have to find a way to combine the two of them and adapt your why so that it meets out with theirs. Because your audience is going to be different depending on where, like what you're teaching, who you're teaching. Like a, a three-year-old's motivation or why is going to be very, very different than a 13-year-old's. Or if you have kids who are more from the suburbs versus from the inner city. So just knowing your audience and theirs, because then it can be more relevant to them. Because each person's going to have a different reason for why they do or don't care about something that you're that you're teaching. Um, so definitely important to know their whys. Um, because the thing is, I think the whole reason we come into nature journaling is to dive deep and analyze and take a moment and look at things much closer. And maybe we should do that starting with the people that are there that have given us their time. So let's just say we're going on a nature walk and these group of people are there, you know, let's take a moment, let's stop and do what we're supposed to do and maybe consider them like the park <laughs> or our nature that's around us at that moment. And let's get to know them a little bit. Let's dive deep and, and see what we can extract from them and learn from them so that we can give back also. Mm. Yeah. I see that um, Christine Cooper's had her hand raised for quite a while. Oh, I'm sorry. I haven't been monitoring those. Uh, Christine, please. You may be able to, uh, I'll ask to unmute. You can unmute yourself um, with the button in the lower oh, left. Okay, am I unmuted now? Yes, you are. I'm, I'm a new learner to this format and I'm warming up to it. Um, <laughs> but I'm really, um, I'm really excited right now and I tend to be an excitable person. So I usually have lots of high energy, but it's so unfair to ourselves to always expect that we're gonna have that kind of energy. And when I find that I have a day like that, what I go into and what I find is really responded to is my quiet inquisitiveness to where if I, you know, I don't have that 105% energy going and I'll just um, go into it. And instead of saying, why am I here? Or if that question comes up, it comes up to me or to the children, I can say, you know, I do this job every day. I come out here and I count butterflies every day. And sometimes that seems like work, but I know that this might be the day that I see that different butterfly or that I reach counting a thousand instead of a hundred. And then I'm instilling hope and curiosity and suddenly we are partners in learning. And I feel like I'm demonstrating for them that adults are lifelong learners too. And I might even express at that time, well, you know, I haven't studied as much about swallowtail butterflies, but I know a lot about monarchs, you know, and then, you know, they're dropping in and saying, oh, well, I know this about monarchs. And suddenly we are relating and the excitement level starts going up from there because we're partners and we're connecting and that's what builds the excitement and then things just blossom from there and so i think to think you know that we're always thinking we have to be a hundred percent on that you know my quiet inquisitiveness is just as enticing sometimes so that's kind of and I'm really enjoying this today. So um, it's great to be part of it. I'm really, I'm getting more excited about participating and um, not hiding behind that cute little white icon and standing in my kitchen in my jammies. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'll do better next time. <laughs> but um, I just see that when they see that I'm asking questions also um, of myself, that they don't have to have a quick answer. It's not like they're in the classroom and they're on the spot with a direct question. That wondering question allows them time to think and we become partners in thinking. It gets them thinking about their thinking. And that's also exciting. And boy, then our energy levels just rise from there. So that quiet inquisitiveness can also be a spark. Um, 
so that's where I'm going with this. I, I really like that thought. I really like that thought. And, and that, that also rings really true from my experience as well. And at times that I've been along the trail with a group of students, you can, I can focus them by, you know, like by putting out all this energy, but also sometimes what I can do is I can see something and then I grab my journal and I just drop down next to it and just start soaking into that. And the students go like, oh, oh, and they start looking at what you're doing and they follow that mm -hmm. focus. I do that all the time with my daughters. Um, mm -hmm. I've got uh, two little daughters, uh, a, a nine and a seven-year-old. And um, when I get, you know, zoomed in on focused on something, all of a sudden, whoop, whoop, you know, there are these two little heads right next to me. Yep. And, and, and I, I find that if in those moments, I start talking like this in that mode, and then all of a sudden, yep. there's this extra focus right there. Right. Yeah. 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 I have found that when I'm whispering suddenly, boy, it just really grabs their attention. It's kind of, they really have to tune in and listen, and it's enticing. And, it, and uh, Billy Joe's pointing out that what you're doing there is just sort of that by being that calm, focused, present, you're modeling the sort of behavior that we would love to see in them. Absolutely, yes, yes. Okay. Um, so. Just wanted to say, um, I noticed that Sharon is raising her hand and also just a quick time check. Um, so we're aware it's um, 1.16. Oh, oh just that, so thank you so much. Um, and also I, I wanna uh, send a, a special thanks out to um, Vivea who is um, co-host um, on this forum with me. Really appreciate having you here and you helping us kind of work logistics and keep an eye on things. So what we're going to do is we're going to jump over to um, to, to Sharon in just a moment, and um, then I just want to uh, just kind of glancing at this page of, of notes we've talked um, through through we talked about trust um, in education. Um, the importance of needing to get to um, to to know the students that you're you're working with, and what sort of social dynamics are driving them and the choices that they're making. What what are their priorities? We talked about being authentic and um, sort of finding your own. Um, finding your own why and making sure you're square with that and then communicating that in a way that they understand. Um, if you sincerely believe that this is, this is worth your time, right? Um, and I can, I can come into a room, I can come into a lesson, into a room with a group of students and, I'm, and, I'm, and I, know, I'm, I feel really confident that I've got something that is gonna be really useful that that's gonna change the way that I interact with them. Um, finding out also then how that connects with where they are and what their motivations are. We've talked about um, the roles of safety and fear in student interactions and, uh, and, and, and motivations. Um, and this whole idea of, you know, to, to, to know their why, to know your why um, is also just a, is a, is an underlinable um, uh, a moment in the day that um, gets some special notes, uh, gets, a, gets a special little uh, bold balloon around it in, in, in my notes. A wonderful, wonderful way of framing things. Sometimes just having a slight turn of phrase that you uh, can come away with makes you think about some things in a, in a slightly different way. And I think that'll be, Liz, I think that'll be one for me um, that I'll be carrying. Um, after we talk with Sharon, um, what I'm going to do is just to sort of close us out, I'm gonna give us five more minutes in a chat room with four people, right? And in that, um, it's an opportunity to share if there's any idea that was, uh, we discussed today that you want to really highlight for yourself, share it with other people that will help them circle that in their notes. 
and um, it would be fun to kind of just hear from a few people. We'll do that. Actually, because it's so late, what we'll do is we're going to go do four minutes. Um, <laughs> well, no, we'll, do, we'll give it, we'll give it five. Um, the uh, and then we'll we'll wrap up for the day. So um, for folks who have uh, been sharing ideas or just part of the community, thank you all so much for being here, and uh, really appreciate you as a community helping us try to figure out what are the best practices in nature journaling education. Um, so Sharon, thank you so much for being with us and you're live. Hi, um, yeah. So the last um, uh, participant that spoke mentioned that you know, counting butterflies and that, you know, sometimes it seems tedious. I think that's important to communicate occasionally is that sometimes the collection of the data is tedious. I'm remembering um, someone that spoke yesterday in the Nature Journal Club meeting talking about measuring the distance of the, the beach at, you know, at king tide compared to, um, another tide and that it took a long time and she had to do it over, you know, had to roll out her measuring tape over and over again to get the measurement. Sometimes it's tedious science. It, <laughs> and I think to acknowledge that occasionally is a great idea. Sometimes it's hard to do. <laughs> That's about all I really have to say about it. Thank you. Um, that's right, and the um, and we also then that does help us also get a sense for um, you know sometimes to get answers it takes work, and that's actually a really useful thing for people to see and to understand, um, and and because that work is hard, um, you know and takes time and real intentionality. Um, that's one of the reasons why the process of science has given us such useful insights into the way that the world works. Um, there are some counterintuitive, repetitious things that you can do, and you do those again and again and again, and it builds a more accurate picture of what is going on. And that helps us be able to avoid some of the biases that sort of naturally plague our, our, our thinking. Um, it's, it's useful to, for people to see that, yeah, that's hard. And that's different than me just sort of kind of sitting back and on a couple of anecdotes, spinning out an explanation. Um, that work gives me strength of evidence for a claim or against a claim. And that's really powerful to see, All right? So um, I am going to um, pop us into some breakout rooms. Um, and um, let's just, uh, we're gonna go there now. Thank you all so much for, um, thank you so much for your participation today. And I really look forward to continuing these discussions with you next week. Hey, Belija. Arpan, Ray Bonto, good to see you guys. Hey, Jack. Hello. That was great. OK, I'm going to head. Have a great day, guys. All right. Really good to Bye. see you. Thank you for joining Bye. us. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye-bye, Bye. everybody. Oh, wait, I haven't hung up yet. Hold on. Oh, not yet. <laughs> Here you go. Okay. I'm feeling oh, 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 hey. Oh, no, that's fine. Yeah, it's fine. Hey, everybody. Welcome back, folks. Um, so we are, uh, we're, we're, we're wrapped up here. Thank you all so much for, for joining us. Um, before we leave, uh, I think, Ray Bonto, you wanted to share um, something with the, with folks? No? Well, oh, he drew a picture. If you one. want. If oh, that's right. Oh, 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 Kingfisher. 
You just drew my favorite bird, my friend. Love these things. And oh. that behavior of building the, the nest into the bank, what a crazy, crazy behavior, right? You'd never expect something, a bird like that, you, you'd like, you're gonna build a nest, right? But no, this thing is going, they go, they dig a hole way back into a cliff by the edge of a stream. That, have, have you seen one of these uh, there in England? Um, no. Not yet, not yet. All right, but um, that is, that's a, a special treat uh, waiting for you folks as you get a chance uh, out to, and to go out and explore. Thank you so Jack, much. Have you, have you heard of this author called Holling C. Holling? <gasps> oh, this is such an amazing, uh, such an amazing uh, uh, author and I love this book. Yeah, there are five or six of them that we have and the illustrations are just mind blowing. Yeah. yeah. And, and all the sort of sketchbook <laughs> things around the edges. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, this book no, probably, um, it has like the life of a hermit crab from yes. Yeah. Yeah, Pagu is the other book. book. Yeah, it's Seabird blows my mind. We uh, haven't come to that yet. Yeah. But we've got it. We've got this, that, that, oh. that. Yeah, there's all these like great nautical things that you can learn um in it. The seabird goes out on an old sailing ship and uh that's really fun. <laughs> Those, those are, and, and, and you get that feeling of um, sketchbook, um, like the, the sketch journal, all those little kind of yeah. uh, the marginalia of, of that series. Fantastic. Yeah, fantastic. fantastic. Wonderful, wonderful books. Thank you um, so much for sharing your, uh, your drawing there and study of the, of the Kingfisher. Um, mm. You, you keep your eyes open because hanging out there in the the um in in the uk you'll look around by rivers and creeks and you you will come across that bird that ridiculously beautiful bright bill intense blue white red um that's a that's a really fun fun bird to, to study. Thank you. So Thanks, Jack. I can't wait for your first field sketch of one of those too. It'll be cool. Hey everybody, thank you all for being here. Um, and um, I hope that you uh, enjoyed our forum. That was a really cool discussion. Um, wanted just for people who um, are still here on this, um, wanted to get some feedback from you folks about having a portion of these um, educator forums being in breakout rooms. Um, uh, if you're in the chat, let me know your your thought and experience um, with that. Um, if that would be something that you'd like to continue in future um, educator workshops, or if that really wasn't your scene, um, that would be helpful for me to 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 know. And you can either do that by unmuting yourselves and talking, or you can type it into the chat. So Jack, I think the breakout rooms were really good. Um, sorry, someone was speaking. Um, go ahead. I'm feeling oh. what I, I'm open to them or however. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was nice. Great. Yeah, so I, when I went in, I didn't have much to share because it was looking from a teacher's perspective. But at the end of the session, there was quite a few insights that I took on paper and it was really worth it to discuss with, uh, with the members then. So I think it, it's really helpful. Great. All right. Um, well, my friends, thank you so much for being here and I look forward to seeing you all again. If anybody's gonna be with us tomorrow um, at uh, noon, We've got the uh, the Nature Journal workshop is going to be about drawing mountain lions, and um, we're going to have a special guest, which is the um, executive, uh, the, the the director, the 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 Western Regional 
uh, executive director of the um, National Wildlife Federation. Um, and she's done some amazing stuff creating wildlife corridors um, for mountain lions. And we'll get a chance to talk with her. You'll get a chance to meet my, um, my really good friend, Beth Pratt. And um, we'll show you some tricks on, we'll be drawing a mountain lion head in a three quarter view. It'll be pretty cool. Um, so want to invite anybody who would like to, to come join us for that. All right, my friends. Yeah, and if, and if you do get the chance to draw the mountain lion face in the field um, from the distance which we'll be drawing it, <clears throat> you have nerves of steel. Um, <laughs> and are either really, really lucky or really, really unlucky. Um, it just all depends on the circumstances. So my friends, take care and I will see you soon. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Jack. Thank you, Jack. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody.